That's right. You had to listen to Beyond Reason Radio here at beyondreasonradio.com. Streaming on the Beyond Reason Radio app, of course, as always, and on Facebook Live as well. I thank you for giving a little bit of your Friday to me as I, um, well, keep you informed, keep you enlightened, give you the latest news of the day, give you some hope, but also we come together with ideas for the future. And so I thank you all for listening. We do the show every Monday and Friday here at 8 p.m. Um, here at BeyondReasonRadio.com, where I, I am the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. A bunch of Beyond Reason stuff to get to today, including, of course, I will end the show like I always do with stories so beyond reason they left me flabbergasted. Um, I also, so it seems like the Orlando Citrus Bowl, Orlando, is now getting the Pro Bowl. So the Pro Bowl, which used to be in Hawaii for years and years and years, it's the their NFL's version of the All-Star Game. I, I would hope you would know that. Um, the Pro Bowl is coming to Orlando. And a lot of people are excited about this. And I guess I should be excited about this being in Orlando. The NFL is going to be playing in Orlando. Seems like a great thing. But I'm not as excited as maybe everyone else is. And I'm going to tell you why a little bit later in the show. And of course, there's some new stuff with this whole transgender thing that I found that is just, well... Beyond Reason, what do you know? <laughs> Since that's the name of the show. So, um, oh, by the way, if you want to chat with the show, you can chat with the show on Facebook, or you can chat with the show on the app live, or you can chat with the show on the website. Just push the chat button, chat with the show, and we'll talk on air. So, you know, it's a talk show. So I talk, and then you talk, and we discuss, and, you know, it's like a you know like a radio show. I, who would have thought a, a radio show, huh? That's what this is. Beyond reason is that. Okay. So before I get to all that, before I get to the usual stuff, I'll get the Orlando stuff, the Labrogasset stuff. We'll get to all that fun stuff later in the show. But I, f- I wanted to talk about something I found very interesting, which I don't feel, at least I haven't noticed it getting as much of attention that maybe it should, but it enlightened me in a lot of ways and confirmed things that I already knew and believed, but it gives hope to that. And I want to share that with you because it's probably the most important thing out there today. And especially with the Egypt air uh, accident, which they think is uh, probably terrorism. They don't know for sure. Um, But putting terrorism, putting the middle East, putting all these problems back in the forefront of everything. And um, this deals with that. But it's very interesting. It's a it's a report from CBS News. Uh, not CBS News, I'm sorry, NBC News did a report. They had an exclusive interview with an American who became a part of ISIS and then regretted it, escaped ISIS, came back to the U.S., was arrested, but is now helping the U.S. and helping the FBI in the fight against ISIS, an American informant, basically. But he was someone who became a terrorist, basically. And the interview is very enlightening about his thinking, about who he is, the kind of person he was to want to do this in the first place, and what he thinks about it now, and what he saw over there. And once again, this is very important to me, because often on this show, I've talked about the war of ideas, that I believe this war against ISIS is first and foremost a war of ideas and it's exactly what it is. And this interview with this ISIS former ISIS member confirms that for me. It it really does. It's a war of ideas against a radical ideology. And he's just proving it more and more. And last week, you know, I gave you that story to give you some hope about how many Muslims are converting to Christianity that are Muslims in the Middle East that have been attacked by ISIS, that are refugees, as bad as that situation is, it's giving some good out of it because they're converting to Christianity. So good can come out. There is hope in the worst kinds of situations, I believe. But let's listen to this. I'm going to play the entire report, and um, we'll go through it. I'm going to play it, and I'm, we're going to talk about it. 
because it's very enlightening about the kind of people that go and become terrorists. And a lot of it is different than what you would think. And I want to get your comments on it as well. As I said, you can chat with me during the show. So uh, here is the start of the report. BBC News exclusive interview with an American citizen who fell under the spell of ISIS. He went from college student to an ISIS training camp in Syria. And after the horrors he saw, he escaped with his life and turned informant. For the first time, he reveals himself to our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, who joins us from Turkey. Richard? Good evening, Lester. We've been investigating the ISIS personnel files for months with a special focus on recruits who came from the U.S. But there has been one American we couldn't reveal until now. He went to an Ivy League college, Columbia University, but ended up in the ISIS capital. We've been asked to call him Mo. When FBI agents brought Mo to meet us. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about that's very interesting to me, and it's something I mentioned before, is this was a highly educated American. This was a highly educated, very smart, a well-off American citizen who was a Muslim. And he decides to go sneak into Syria and try to become a terrorist. Think about that for a second. We keep hearing this argument that the, what's creating the terrorist is our interventionist policies, is we're bombing them over there. You know, they're poor, they're desperate, they just want to do anything to get help. And yet here we have an American citizen who is well-educated, very intelligent, well off, is not poor, has the abilities to not only go to a very good school, but to travel to the other side of the world, join ISIS. What influenced him? What made him want to do that in the first place? Well, it's what I've been talking about. It's the radical ideology that is making him want to do this in the first place. And there are many terrorists, you know, I think a couple of the terrorists in um, Britain many years ago, there were doctors you know, the, the terrorists of the Boston bombers, they, they were well off. They didn't do it because of money. They were American citizens, had the benefits of our society, and yet they still wanted to become terrorists. And it shows what we're fighting, like I've been saying, is a war of ideas. It has to be deeper than a military thing. And I keep hearing people have this argument all the time that if we just stop bombing them, if we just leave the Middle East, we get rid of our quote-unquote non-interventionist policy or interventionist policies, they're going to all of a sudden like us. And to me, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what drives this terrorist movement. Of course, I just asked them, before 9-11, what countries in the Middle East were we bombing before 9-11? The only one was Iraq. Most of these terrorists come from Saudi Arabia, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Egypt, and Iran. We didn't, before 9-11, we didn't bomb any of those places. We weren't bombing Syria before 9-11. We weren't bombing Afghanistan before 9-11. The Russians were, not us. We weren't bombing Iran before 9-11. Yeah, we did. We helped with a military coup years and years ago. Because they had some kind of so they had a socialist who was getting power over there, but the terrorists are not concerned about that now. We've never we're not bombed. We never bombed Saudi Arabia. We we have we've worked with Saudi Arabia to help them become a rich country. We've never we don't we've never bombed Egypt. We're, none of this is happening. None of this has happened. Yet we keep hearing well, us and the NATO countries have been bombing these. Middle Eastern countries forever. For the last three decades. Not really. Most of the breakup in the Middle East came after World War I. And there's been some skirmishes, but they hit America. And they hated us long before we started, we were over there bombing them. So there's something else that is driving this movement. And it's because they believe that our influence, our way of life, which is appealing to the world because we have prosperity, we have health, stuff like that. 
they feel that our existence contradicts what they want, which is the caliphate, the Islamic state. And it's that struggle between modernity and Westernization and progress against their idea of a perfect Islamic state. And it's been against us, but it's been against some of their leaders. A little history lesson for you. But I, I digress. It goes back to what he said in the beginning or what he was in the beginning, what it said. He was from America, Columbia University, very well off. He was a, he's a good looking guy. He's, he's not poor, but yet he still wanted to go and fight for ISIS. The good news is, well, we'll continue on. He realizes his mistakes later on. He was wearing clothes his mother got him for the interview instead of his prison uniform. Mo, who came to this country when he was a year old and grew up in New York, pled guilty to terrorism charges and faces up to 25 years in prison. I've let my family down, I've let my nation down, and I've let God down, and I have a lot to make up for. So are you, in this interview and other places, apologizing? Absolutely. I lost sight of how people could be so evil. Mo dropped out of Columbia University. He found ISIS propaganda online and lured by the promises of a pure Islamic state, he traveled to Turkey and snuck into Syria. Once again, what lured him over there? It was the ideology, which he found online, dropped out of a very prominent university, and went over there. But it was interesting earlier when he said, I forgot how evil people can be. He went over there and said, These, this is evil. And, you know, we have an administration. We have people that we just want to understand them and have a conversation with them and get to know their real issues. If we change our thinking, they won't hate us anymore. And this guy is over there like, you don't understand. This movement in the Middle East is deeper than just a misunderstanding. It's evil. It's truly evil. And this is a Muslim himself saying that, which we will need good Muslims to fight against this as well. He continues on here. At 25, he ended up in an ISIS training camp, like this one. Did you see evidence of all the gore that we see in the ISIS propaganda? I did see uh, severed heads placed on spiked poles. You saw heads on a stake? Yeah. What did you think? I just blocked it out. I tried to ignore it. You could see madness in their eyes. You could see madness in their eyes? Yeah. This is cra it's crazy what we're fighting against. True evil. Don't. <laughs> if, if you wonder if you're on the right side, you should not wonder when, when it's us fighting against ISIS. We're on the right side. We're the good guys in this instance. Another thing, unfortunately, we don't hear enough in our society. But, I mean, just some evidence of the true evil that he saw over there. Um, he continues on. One of the so-called scholars was showing off a suicide belt, Mo says. He walked in carrying a suicide belt. People were gravitating towards it, touching it like it's an exhibit. And people were just in awe of it. Did they want to try it out? They didn't allow anyone to wear it. They were just coming close to just look at it. Mo says. So they're bragging in about a suicide belt. Uh, he's over there, becomes a terrorist, former American citizen, goes over there, becomes a terrorist, ISIS recruit, and he sees him bragging about a suicide belt. What, I mean, what drives that, if not evil, and a radical evil ideology? And part of the problem as well is the people in terrorist terrorism that are from the Middle East they have been pounded with this propaganda, Islam, radical Islamic propaganda since they were kids. And it's been pounded into them and pounded into them, a lot of them. And it gets to the point where they truly believe this is the right thing to do. And it's going to be a very hard struggle to fight against that. When you have people so messed up, so misguided by a radical ideology that they're bragging about a suicide belt. There's something wrong and it's going to take a long time. But once again, it's going to take a war of ideas. It's going to take leadership 
from this country and other and good Muslims as well. And people like this standing up saying this is the wrong way. There is a better way in the world. Let me show you what will you be an example of what that is. That's what it's going to take. But unfortunately, we don't have leadership that cares about that. We have no leadership right now that really wants to put that out there. I mean, we have a president right now who thinks that if we just play nice with our enemies, they'll like us more. And that's because he doesn't necessarily believe we're the good guys in most foreign instances. And you have libertarians and some Republicans who believe that as well. That we've created this problem. In some ways, we did because we left Iraq too soon. I mean, you could say ISIS, you know, if we never invaded Iraq, ISIS wouldn't have been there. But there would have been other terrorists in there. The radical ideology has been there long before our involvement in the Middle East. The radical ideology has been there for a long time. And it has grown and it has grown and it has become this powerful evil movement. And it's going to take a long time to fight against it. Let's not be naive about the enemy here. But unfortunately we are. He continues on here. This was not the Islamic State he was hoping to immigrate to. Do you regret that you had gone there? More than anything. It's obviously the worst decision I've ever made in my life. He eventually managed to escape from Syria and went right to the U.S. consulate in Turkey. When he got back to the U.S., the FBI put him under arrest. And for the last year and a half, he has been working with the government. They'll say he'll say whatever is necessary to make himself look sympathetic, to try and get softer treatment, a lighter sentence. It's legitimate. And, you know, I think I have a real message, and that's the most important thing. The Islamic State is not bringing Islam to the world. And people need to know that. The FBI told us Mo is now incarcerated, but for security reasons couldn't tell us where. The agency says Mo has assisted the government in a number of ways, some of which are sensitive because they relate to ongoing investigations. Lester? Richard Engel from Istanbul. Thank so there you go. And he's right. The message does need to get out there. It confuses me why he thought it was any different to begin with. But there's a lot of people in this country that are completely misinformed about what this is all about. They really have no idea. They have no understanding of what we're really fighting against, of religion, of ideology, of history. And when you don't, and stuff like that can be appealing, and it's wrong. But this whole issue, what bothers me about it most is we're not... It's one another one of those issues where we're not being... We're not embracing reality of what's really going on. That this is so much deeper than just some kind of international, you know, some kind of regional conflict that we just need to stay out of and they'll, they'll forget about us and, you know, it'll be all fine. Their goals in that movement is to destroy our civilization. And they're going to do the most evil things they can to do it. And it's driven by their ideology. Now, they they won't succeed, but I just feel like sometimes our country and other countries really don't understand. We really don't understand that. And we think if we just ignore it, it'll go away. I don't think that's going to happen. It's we can't ignore it, but we need to fight it on the battle, the battle front of ideas. So there you go. All right. In the next segment, I'm going to talk about the Pro Bowl coming to Orlando. The show is Orlando Smart Talk Radio, and a lot of people are excited. The NFL Pro Bowl is coming here. I'm not so much that excited. And there's a reason why, and it directly connects to something that I've talked about in the past couple shows. So we're going to get to that, and um, we have other stories, so Beyond Reason, you'll just have to tune in. You're listening to Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe, here at BeyondReasonRadio.com.
Get Yaffe's take on the Beyond Reason issues every day. Follow him on Twitter at Beyond Reason R. That's Beyond Reason and the letter R. There are so many clothing fads out there that are just beyond reason. But here at Beyond Reason Radio, we want to let you in on a new patriotic fad that will never fade. That fad stands for Freedom All Day. Freedom All Day is the latest apparel brand for the true patriot who is not afraid to show it. Their mission is to give people an opportunity to show patriotism all year and to do it while looking good. Check out their latest stuff, including their newest t-shirts at freedomalldayapparel.com. At freedomalldayapparel.com, you can find all kinds of different cool-looking t-shirts, and they are all made in America. Go to freedomalldayapparel.com and be part of the fad that never fades. If you miss any of the show, you can download the Beyond Reason podcast on iTunes. Welcome back to Beyond Reason Radio, Orlando Smart Talk Radio. I do the show every Monday and Friday live at 8 p.m. on BeyondReasonRadio.com and the Beyond Reason Radio app and Facebook live as well. You can chat with the show live. Just push the chat button on the app or on Facebook, or you can just follow me on Twitter at Beyond Reason R, and you can chat with me anytime. You can comment on anything I post, posting stuff all the time, and you get my take on stuff that I mention. So, breaking news, mostly today. I guess it came out late last night, but it really got attention this morning. And it's big news in Orlando, and it's got a lot of people talking and hopeful for maybe something in the future. Turns out that the NFL Pro Bowl which is the NFL's version of their all-star game, which usually doesn't do as well in the ratings as most NFL things. And they've been trying to find ways to make it more interesting, make it more relevant. Well, it turns out that the Pro Bowl, which has been played in Hawaii for years, is coming to Orlando. That's right. Since the Citrus Bowl was redone, and now it's Camping World Stadium. What a weird name. Camping World Stadium. But since the Citrus Bowl was redone, the Pro Bowl, the NFL met, you know, a lot of cities bid to get the Pro Bowl, and Orlando won. And it's big news, and the Orlando Sentinel had it, and Mike Bianchi from the Orlando Sentinel was talking about it and saying that this is making Orlando one step closer to getting its own NFL team. And technically, we're an NFL city now since we have an NFL game. He said... Excuse me, I have running nose or something. He said, can you say Orlando Jaguars? He thinks eventually maybe we get the Jaguars because they're not as, because we have bigger population here than Jacksonville. Can I tell you something? So everyone's excited about this. Everyone thinks, oh, this means the Orlando, such a good idea to redo the Citrus Bowl. Gonna help our economy so much. We could get an NFL team. Such great things for Orlando. Yay, state government. Yay, local government. We spent all this money, but yay, look what we're getting out of it. $200 million in the hole for just a redone stadium, but yay! And they're expecting me to be one of these people that thinks this is such a great thing. And I'm like, no. I mean, I'm glad it's coming here. I think that's cool. Maybe I'll even go. I doubt it. I doubt I'll get tickets. But, and yeah, it'll probably help the economy a little bit. But let's go back to a story that was big news last week. That I was talking about this. Obama's transgender decree to all schools in the country saying they had to let kids use whatever bathroom, whatever locker room they wanted And the way they got around this is they said, you do this or we're going to take away federal funds to schools. And I'm thinking, so people are like, you're extorting us. And my point was, this is what happens when state governments, when local governments are so completely dependent on the federal government for money that you're giving the federal government more control and stuff like this is happening. This is also how Common Core Core is being implemented for the same way. They 
bribe the states to accept it and get all this money out of it. And really, state governments and local governments are constantly, constantly applying for federal federal money for everything. And to me, there's something that bothers me, officially bothers me, when we have to constantly beg the federal government. Right now, we're begging for Zika funding to fight against Zika. We're begging the federal government for that. We, anytime we have to redo a major highway, we beg, beg the federal government for that, for education, for redoing all kinds of other stuff. Even for sports game, we're, we're constantly begging the federal government for, this more, for more money, okay? And we think there's nothing wrong with that. And then when the federal government, when Obama does some kind of decree telling the states what to do, we get upset. And I'm thinking, you, what do you expect When you become so dependent on the federal government for money, that's what happens. And there's something wrong with the fact, for one, I have to pay these expensive tolls on some of these roads. The federal government help pays for highways. They give money to police departments. They give money to build this and build that in different cities. And then in the next breath, we're using Local tax dollars, yes, I understand it's the tourist tax dollars, which I think should not should be used for anything. We're using local tax dollars to pay for a sports stadium. Maybe, to me, the local government's role first should be those fundamental things, like education, like the roads, like police, fire, those things we really need in in infrastructure spending, stuff like that. That is what the local government should be spending. But every time one, the economy goes down a little bit or two, the federal government doesn't give us as much money as we want in the state and local level. We complain, we cry, we have to cut spending on schools and we have to cut spending on all this. And yet here's something that local government spent $200 million on And they wanted to spend millions more on a soccer stadium. And they spent millions of dollars on the Amway Center. And we think it's, oh, this is so great. Look what we're spending this money on. And at the same breath, we're begging the federal government for things we really need. There's something screwed up about that. There's something screwed up about the fact that our local governments can't afford to give us what we really need, yet they can afford to build giant stadiums so we can get like the Pro Bowl or something. Our whole thinking on the role of government is screwed up. And we don't realize this is happening because it's, you know, when you're a politician, when you're a local politician, it is so easy to stand in front of a new Citrus Bowl or Camping World Stadium or whatever it's called now. And say, look what I got you. Vote for me. And people do. But what, but then what happens is you are giving, every time you do something like that, you are giving the federal government more control over your life. They have more control over the states now and over the local governments now. And they're pushing for even more control. There's a new housing and urban development regula- regulation that they're trying to pass that basically puts the federal government in charge of zoning of zoning districts in local governments and where housings can go. And if they're not diverse enough, they can do this and that. And the reason the federal government can get away with this is we're so dependent on the money. We're so dependent on the federal money. And I ask why, why are we so dependent on the federal money? The point is we're not. The point is we, the the state has plenty of money to spend on the stuff we truly need. Yet they waste it on things like sports stadiums. That money has to be borrowed, by the way, to pay for it. It's paid back through bonds and all this stuff. But we're spending money on all this stuff we don't really need. We had the biggest budget in Florida history this past year that was passed. The biggest budget ever. Yet now we're begging the federal government for Zika money, money to fight Zika. We beg the federal government for more roads and stuff. And then our local governments build a giant, spend two hundred million dollars on a sports stadium. Does this not? And this happens all over the state. Does anyone under, understand what I'm saying here? That this dependence on the federal government for all this money, and then are spending our local money on stuff like this makes no sense. 
if the federal government was doing what it should be doing with our tax dollars, really should be doing, we wouldn't have all these issues. And we wouldn't have the federal government making decrees saying you have to do this or you're not going to get the money. We should say, fine, I don't want your money because we have the money ourselves in our own state and we're going to do what our state want, thinks is best to do. But no, this is what we do. So that's why I'm not super excited about the Pro Bowl because now that this is happening, everybody's going to say we're vindicated on spending $200 million. So we're all saying, yes, look what the $200 million for the Citrus Bowl Camping World Stadium has done. And I'm saying, did you all forget last week when Obama made a decree about transgender bathrooms that nobody likes? And extorted us for money. Do you all remember that? The federal government taking over? Well, it's stuff like this that enables that. So don't complain then. That's where I am. Do you agree or disagree with me? You can chat with the show at beyondreasonradio.com. When I get back, speaking of the transgender issue, I have something ooh, unbelievable. There was a survey done. There was a survey done at a local, uh, well, not a local school. It was, a, it was a university in Seattle, Washington. And what some of the kids answered, whew, really eye-opening and really unbelievable to me. Kids, I turn 30 now and I become a grumpy old man. These kids, they don't know anything. You're listening to Beyond Reason Radio here at beyondreasonradio.com. You want to listen to Beyond Reason Radio live on your smartphone? Download the Beyond Reason Radio app now. Available in the Google Play or Apple App Stores. There are so many clothing fads out there that are just beyond reason. But here at Beyond Reason Radio, we want to let you in on a new patriotic fad that will never fade. That fad stands for Freedom All Day. Freedom All Day is the latest apparel brand for the true patriot who is not afraid to show it. Their mission is to give people an opportunity to show patriotism all year and to do it while looking good. Check out their latest stuff, including their newest t-shirts at freedomalldayapparel.com. At freedomalldayapparel.com, you can find all kinds of different cool-looking t-shirts, and they are all made in America. Go to freedomalldayapparel.com and be part of the fad that never fades. If you like Beyond Reason Radio, well, make sure to show it by liking the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Radio. Welcome back. This is the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. Like Orlando, beyond reason. Still think it's beyond reason they spent so much to redo that citrus bowl, but now everyone thinks it's a great thing because we're getting the Pro Bowl. By the way, to get the Pro Bowl, we don't need just a stadium, but they're saying it could cost $2.5 million per year as a hosting fee. $2.5 million per year as a hosting fee to get the Pro Bowl here. Now, Honolulu paid $5 million a year, but they're saying we wouldn't have to pay that much. So what happened last week, or Orange County's Tourist Development Council voted unanimously to recommend $3 million in hotel taxes to help land the Pro Bowl. So there's $3 million that could be used for something that the government really needs, should be doing. Going to the Pro Bowl. Now, I know all you, I know there's people out there saying, well, they have to. Our tourist tax dollars, our hotel tax dollars, they have to go to stuff like this. That's the way it's written in the law. I know, and I hate that. I hate that. Why can't we use tourist tax dollars for, say, infrastructure, for, say, police, for stuff the government really needs education? Why? Where was this idea that tourist tax dollars had to go for stuff like this? That's my problem with all this. So then we have to get more for that other stuff. We have to get more from property tax dollars and sales tax dollars and stuff like that. And we could have gotten some of it from the tourist tax dollars. But, you know, we think it's the government's job now to build stadiums and to get sports teams here. This is where we are. We're not the only, I mean, lots of states do this. So it's not like we're the only ones doing this. But it's just something I wish would change in the thinking and the minds of the states especially when the federal government is dictating to states what to do now. Well, that's because you're spending your money on sports stadiums. That's just the way it is. So I, I, I don't like the rules that the tourist tax dollars has to go to stuff like this, and the taxes have they, they're going to spend more tax money. This is not private money. The NFL makes billions of dollars a year, 
And, you know, this is all tax money. This is your tax dollar. Oh, but he says it will help the brand of Orlando as a tourist destination. Help the brand. Okay. I guess. You know what doesn't help the brand? Crime increasing a lot in Orlando. Crime in certain parts right outside in the Paramore area is really bad. And we're not doing anything about it. That doesn't help Orlando. But it's just more corporate welfare. You know, if I wanted to start a business, you know, they're they're building this new UCF downtown campus. And, of course, that's taxpayer money that's going to that as well. And I'm thinking UCF gets to do that. But if I wanted to start a business in or in downtown Orlando, do I, do I get any government money to do that? If I wanted to start some kind of business? No. Would you get any government money to do that? No. Many people that are starting small businesses out there, are you getting any government money to do that? No. But, you know, the NFL, NFL teams, sports teams, stuff like that, UCF, they get tons of government money to do that. Why should they get it and not you? Because the government plays favorites. That's what happens. <laughs> we, we, you want to know where corruption in government's coming from. And in Washington and local government, that's exactly where it happens. And yet, we think this is great. I don't think so. Okay, I want to move on from that. Um, because I, this is interesting. There's, um, there's a video that's on YouTube this week of a guy. He goes to Seattle University in Washington State. And he asks people about the transgender issue. And what he, what they say is extremely, is very revealing about what some college students think, how we might be lost on this issue for, to be honest, they start out by asking them, should people be allowed to use whatever bathroom they want and so forth. And, um, well, this is. This is what he said. First, I wanted to say it is coming from the Family Institute of Washington is the group that did this video. The Family Institute of Washington at Seattle University. And he asked students this. I'm aware of the conversation going on in Washington State right now around kind of gender identity, gender expression issues, and the ability to access facilities on those grounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, there's, there's general neutral bathrooms and like all the dorms and stuff like that. I think that gender is fluid, so... If you want to use a bathroom because that's a place and that's a space where you feel comfortable and safe in doing so, then I think that that's completely fine. I think that I think that gender is fluid. What in the world does that mean? I, it's wow. Let's continue on here. If whoever you think you are, if you're male or female, then that's the bathroom you should go into. I think if it doesn't really negatively affect anybody, then I think anyone be, should be able to choose what gender they uh, choose to identify as. People, no matter what their gender identification is, they should be allowed to use whatever restrooms they should they, they feel like they identify with. Is there a difference in your mind between men and women? Okay, before I get to that issue, though, <laughs> this is where they stand now. They think, well, based on what you feel your gender is on the inside, you should be able to use whatever bathroom you want. Okay, so that's where their thinking is, that if you're a man, but you feel on the inside you're a woman, you should get to use whatever bathroom you want. But in the next thing here you're getting to, he asks them something very interesting. He asked them, do you think there's a difference between a man and a woman? It's a pretty obvious question to me, to you, I'm sure. But listen to what they said. Um, no, yes. I mean, um, possibly in general, yes. But I don't know why I think that. Socially, currently, yes, there is. There is no need for that difference to exist, uh, scientifically and logically. If you think that you're a male, if you think that you're a female, that matters more than the biological difference. There's oh, my gosh. Did you hear that one guy? He was he's just so intelligent. You know, it, it, it makes no sense uh, logically and biologically that there is a difference. 
what scientifically that they're what the hell are you talking about man <laughs> of course it does <laughs> I just they ignore reality and you know someone pointed out and I kind of agreed that it's not that they really believe this stuff. I don't know. Some of them seem like they really do, but that they're afraid they say they don't because they're afraid of being called bigoted or whatever. It's the whole fear aspect, which is just ridiculous. But think about this, for instance, and I was thinking about this. I want, you probably stay with me here. So they believe that there are people out there that should choose their different bathrooms, that there are guys out there that on the inside feel like they're women and should be able to change how they look and how they behave and even some of their biology to become women, even though they're a man. So they believe that in one instance, but then in the next breath, they believe that there's no difference between a man and a woman. Well, if there's no difference between a man and a woman, then why would a man feel like a woman on the inside? Because it wouldn't matter because there's no difference, right? Even the transgenders themselves believe there's a difference. <laughs> That's the point. The transgender people themselves believe there's a difference because they're changing themselves based on the what they believe is the difference. So, of course, there's a difference between a man and a woman. <laughs> and the transgenders themselves believe it. So how can you say in one breath, that you should be able to choose your gender. When you say you'll be able to choose your gender, you're admitting that there's a difference in the genders. So in one breath, you're, being, you're saying you're able to choose your gender. But in the next breath, you're saying there's not a difference between a man and a woman. You just, you, you just said there was. What are you talking about? See how this is so illogical? It's just, it's, it makes, it's unbelievable. And yet these kids think they're so brilliant. <laughs> and so smart and so progressive when they're they're insane. It continues on here. Not much difference besides what society forces on to people. And how do you know the difference between men and women? By what people think they are. So you can't like judge someone just on like their looks. I don't think there's anyone. Okay. First off, society forces you. You know, when I was a little kid. I don't remember society forcing me to play with Ninja Turtles and G.I. Joe. I, I don't remember ever. I don't remember there anybody ever for, telling me I had to. I was never forced. I just wanted to do that. You know, I'm growing a beard right now. I don't remember. I don't think society's forcing me to do that. I just, I'm a man and I want to do stuff like that because I'm a man. And then they're saying, once again, they're saying there's a difference, even though there's not a difference, which I, I don't know. You, I can't even follow it anymore. One way to really distinguish between a man or a woman, and I don't think it's necessary. Uh, it's not always consistent. It has a high probability, like 98% of the time I can get it right. There is some ambiguity. I think, yeah, there are ways to tell, but then again, you can always be wrong. What would you say I am? Just judging off of your looks, I would say that you're a male. I would probably assume a man, but then you never know. A male. Why would you say that? Based on how I look at you. <laughs> Do you think that's a problem? Yeah, probably. Why is that a problem? I am so glad that women look different than men. I'm just saying. I like that a woman doesn't look like a man. I just, why, why is this a problem? They are different, as Dustin commented on on the chat. There are huge differences between men and women. Women, of course, there is. <laughs> Just we all know. They know. They know. They can't even admit. The guy's like, "What do you think I am?" Well, I think you're a man. Why? Because there's a difference. Are we insane? These kids. These hoodlums. I'm, I know I'm turning into a grumpy old man, but what am I supposed to do? I, I just, you throw, they think they're so intelligent and progressive and they're throwing reality and logic and reason out the window. <laughs> For what? Because this has been pushed down our throats. Unbelievable. And this, by the way, in the next segment, I have a story. Really, so it's kind of it's related to this, and it is definitely so beyond reason. 
it will leave you flabbergasted. Yes. Yes, it will. I thank you all for listening. You are listening to Beyond Reason Radio here at BeyondReasonRadio.com and streaming live on the Beyond Reason Radio app. And I'll be right back. If you heart Beyond Reason Radio, listen to the Beyond Reason Radio podcast on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app and search Beyond Reason Radio. There are so many clothing fads out there that are just beyond reason. But here at Beyond Reason Radio, we want to let you in on a new patriotic fad that will never fade. That fad stands for Freedom All Day. Freedom All Day is the latest apparel brand for the true patriot who is not afraid to show it. Their mission is to give people an opportunity to show patriotism all year and to do it while looking good. Check out their latest stuff, including their newest t-shirts at freedomalldayapparel.com. At freedomalldayapparel.com, you can find all kinds of different cool-looking t-shirts, and they are all made in America. Go to freedomalldayapparel.com and be part of the fad that never fades. Listen to the latest episodes of Beyond Reason. Download the podcast at Spreaker.com. Welcome back. Glad you all joined me. It's Friday. It's near the end of the show. And you know what that means. There are a lot of stories that are beyond reason. But some stories are so unbelievable, so crazy, so unexpected, that there is only one way to describe Yaffe's reaction. Now for stories so beyond reason, they left Yaffe flabbergasted. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, they do. And this the hardest part about this segment is narrowing it down to one or two stories because there is so much out there I could say. But I found this story, and if this doesn't leave you flabbergasted, nothing will. I had to bring this up, especially so I was talking about the transgender thing again. <laughs> it's just this. I found this on the dailywire.com. And, um, whew, <laughs> you're just, uh, can you tell, can you tell I'm flabbergasted? I, I think you can tell. I think, I think it's pretty obvious. All right. Here's the headline. Feminist says Jesus was a transgender. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. I didn't read that in John or Matthew or Mark or Luke. You know. But apparently, Jesus, Jesus himself was a transgender. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This changes my religious <laughs> stand. Attempting to make the case against Christians who stand with biology, a feminist blogger, Katie Grimes, explained tongue-in-cheek that Jesus himself was transgender. Mm -hmm. You know, because of the whole my dad's God thing. Because his dad is God. That means Jesus is transgender. Stay with me on this, people, I, if you can. I know you're all flabbergasted by now. Crime states, since Jesus had no human biological father, and since God, his heavenly father, lacks a body, then Jesus was a man who likely had no Y chromosome. There you go. Because God has no Y chromosome, I guess. So Jesus had no Y chromosome. So Jesus was a transgender. Is this So we should be accepting more of transgenderism because Jesus was a trans... You know, if, if you can convince people Jesus was a transgender, would this not make... This is the story here. Would this not make Jesus more like a transgender person? Then a, cisgen a cisgender one, she asked. I don't know. What's a cisgender? I don't know what that means. We could grant Jesus a Y chromosome, but then we would have to assign his virgin mother Mary one as well. <laughs> this, this, what they come up with to push their ideology. <laughs> oh, oh. Now the person says, essentially... What Grimes writes is nonsensical. Jesus was fully man and fully God, as the scripture says. Now, she said this in sarcasm, so maybe we'll give her a pass. But when you read a headline 
that Jesus was transgender. You know, I can't, I can't ignore it. <laughs> when I do a segment where things leave me flabbergasted, it's hard to ignore a story like that. The blogger says that Christians cannot oppose the new leftist push to mainstream the fallacy that men can be women and women can be men, an idea at odds with science. Going further, Grimes argues that the objection to overreaching governmental mandates, which allow bathroom and locker rooms to be open to gender identity rather than biology, is at odds with Christianity. Yep. You know, Jesus was like, you know, he was saying, give to the poor, love your enemies, and open bathrooms for all. Uh, that was, I think that was in Matthew somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> she says the Christian case against strange gender people typically trumpets the single line from Genesis in which God presumably created human beings, male and female, as evidence that God intends for each individual to be either male or female. And that's why this is being attacked. They, they want to attack Christianity. That's a big reason why this transgender thing is being pushed, because it attacks Christians. They are so desperate to get Christianity out of our society. Trust, trust me on that. They can't wait to try to get Christianity out of our society. But let's be honest here. Most of us are not against the transgender thing because of our faith. We're against it because we know, because we see it, that a man is different than a woman. We know it, and we're glad that they're different. I want a woman to be different. I don't want a woman to be a man. I like that they're women, and I like that I'm a man, and I like that we're different. It's a beautiful thing. And it also goes with reality that if you have certain parts, no matter what you feel, you are still what you are. <laughs> it's just the way it is. It even goes beyond our Christianity. So I thought that would um, <laughs> just... Oh man, I just, I, some days I just don't know how to, how I deal with the, our craziness out there, the beyond reasonness. All right. Got a verse from you from one of my favorite books of the Bible, Philippians, different one today, which I hope you will like, uh, Philippians chapter three, verse 12, one of my favorite verses, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In the real Jesus, not the transgender one. <laughs> If you like the show, listen to the podcast later and share it with your friends, and I will see you guys on Monday. Have a good weekend.